Magnolia Projects has been spoken about, you know, in music so much, but being a kid and growing up there, what was it like? I mean, in terms of the violence, like what were some of the most violent things you saw growing up? Murder, 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 man. One New Orleans teenager is dead, another in jail tonight after an accidental shooting. Police say two 16-year-olds were playing with a 25 caliber handgun on North Claiborne Avenue when the gun discharged. The bullet hit one of the boys in the chest. He was rushed to Charity Hospital where he died a short time later. The second youth has been booked with negligent homicide. And a New Orleans man has been booked for the murder of a Clio Street grocery store owner. Police say 22-year-old Ronald Anderson was the trigger man during an armed robbery at a Clio Street store last Wednesday. Anderson was arrested tonight at his Clio Street apartment. It will be charged with first-degree murder and armed robbery. The second suspect is still at large. In 1993, with nearly 80 homicides per 100,000 people, the city of New Orleans homicide rate led Detroit and Washington two other high crime cities, according to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In the first quarter of this year, the homicide rate for the city of New Orleans was up 36% over the previous year, and it was still leading the other two cities' rates. The homicide rate of New Orleans metropolitan area led all other cities in 1992, the last year for which federal figures were made available. In 1993, the homicide count reached a new intensity with 195 through May the 30th. You're watching Channel 6, WDSU-TV, New Orleans. And now, Norman Robinson, Susan Rosgen, AMS meteorologist Dan Milham with weather, and Skip Baldwin with sports. This is Channel 6 News Tonight. They make their living poking fun at people, and tonight they're turning their pins loose on New Orleans. Also, you'll hear the story of a Chinese woman. She was smuggled into the U.S., and tonight she's still hiding. But first, people in this neighborhood are fed up with crime, and tonight they're taking back their streets. Good evening. I'm Norman Robinson. And I'm Susan Rosgen. It's the worst possible problem when you know there are drug dealers on your own street, when crime comes often and openly, and you can't get anyone to do anything about it. That's what confronts people who live near Uptown. This is a neighborhood that has to help itself, and Janet Witters is there to show us how. Susan, basically what they had to do is do it. So many communities have decided they have to do as well, and that is to organize. But it's more than that. They have decided that they need to hold the leaders responsible. Community leaders, the city council, the police, anyone who might be able to help them in their dilemma. This is just another way that people are getting together to try and save our streets. First of all, we're going to take them back with prayers, and we're going to take them back with programs that can help keep them off the streets. And Deliria Rancifer is one concerned resident. Delian Castain is another. I mean, all of this stuff is destroying the neighborhood. But if everybody moves out of it, you don't have a neighborhood. They see abandoned buildings, grime, and crime in broad daylight, and they're frustrated. But what I cannot understand, if you can see them, and you tell the police why they can't ever see. So were council members and police. They meant knowing they wouldn't find immediate solutions, but they could find common ground in the fight against crime. It takes the people to come together in order, and for them to demand change in order for change to occur. But some residents insist they've heard this all before in meeting after meeting after meeting. And they're suspicious of empty promises, but they still have some room for hope. You don't need to think your crime and drugs will stay here, because once they've conquered it, they're going on into the more affluent neighborhood. So if you can't correct the problem here, you can't correct it anywhere. Through persistence, this group has already gotten one victory. They are getting a police substation in their neighborhood. Susan? Well, Janet, they may have been to a lot of meetings, but you know there is strength in numbers. That's right. And that's the one thing that they can hope for, that people will listen, because there are so many of them. All right. Thank you, Janet.
six people were killed in one day that month. Frank Minyard is on record stating that the bodies were piling up so fast that his staff was overwhelmed. The mayor of New Orleans during a press conference would say that the city was under siege, with a city being patrolled by corrupt cops who are just as dangerous if not more dangerous than the dudes in the streets. The feds would step in and compile a report aimed at trying to get a grip on the violent crimes taking place in New Orleans. Well, tonight, police are still investigating another violent episode in New Orleans. Officers found 39-year-old Sadie Swain stabbed to death inside her home on Plum Street. Police also found 42-year-old Ronald Lawson, who's now charged with second-degree murder. Officers say the two were arguing when Lawson allegedly pulled a knife and stabbed Swain. This latest killing brings the city's murder total now to 203. And experts are warning us to expect an increase in murders during the summer months. They found a statistical connection between heat and homicide. Those findings show that there is no ceiling, that the hotter it gets, the, the more there's a direct increase in the number of homicides. And the numbers from last year appear to prove that theory. Homicides in the third quarter were nearly as high as those from the first half of the year combined. But in West Wego tonight, the police are getting ahead of the crooks. They've made a big dent in the local drug problem. The police spent the day rounding up street-level drug dealers. They've made 12 arrests so far, but they're not finished. They have 25 names on their hit list, and the arrests are the result of a year-long undercover investigation. The report would read as such. The New Orleans murder rate has been the primary focus of concerns about crime in the city during recent years. The concern is well taken. Though the murder rate has been high in New Orleans since the early 1970s, the trend in the last five years has been frightening. The murder rate rose steadily in New Orleans during the decade of the 60s, more than doubling. In the early 70s, the rate stopped rising and fluctuated within the same range for about 15 years. Beginning in about 1988, however, the rate began to increase again, but at a rate much greater than it had during the 1960s, doubling in six years. Projection from the first six months of 1993 indicated that the increase is continuing. The New Orleans murder rate was typical of cities its size through the 60s, but began to diverge in the early 1970s. During the 70s and early to mid 80s, the New Orleans murder rate averaged about double the rate for comparable cities. After 1988, the New Orleans rate soared to as much as triple the comparable city rate. Jefferson and St. Tammany Parish murder trends were very similar both to each other and to average rates for suburban areas from 1970 to the mid-80s. In the mid-80s, St. Tammany dropped below the suburban average and Jefferson Parish rates to move significantly higher, peaking in 1990, at most double the average suburban rate. Let's get back to the F. In the city of New Orleans, there are gangsters and killers in every hood. No one man calls the shots in New Orleans. The Magnolia Project was infamously known for having some of the most notorious gangsters in the city. Blackie Moe, Tippy, and Stuff, just to name a few. There's a handful of times that I can recall any of the gangsters getting into actual fistfights without any repercussions coming behind it. Don't get it twisted. That doesn't mean that they were never challenged. Michael Bullock and Barrowhead, two certified dudes from the streets, would at one point both have fights with Blackie Moe. Eric Maurice, the cousin of Blackie Moe, was also known for being a notorious gangster and jack artists from the city. One thing about Uptown and that know you, when it came to being fly, dudes were doing their thing. Eric Maurice will forever be known as one of the flyest dressers from the know you. Unbeknownst to many, Eric Maurice has two sisters who were about that foolishness, Danielle and Chinese. They weren't letting any of the girls from other hoods and projects play with them. In fact, they ain't let any girl that the know you play with them either. I can still remember Chinese beating the brakes off girls in the project. If you know, you know. One of the most infamous stories told about Eric Maurice was him dressing up like a clown to put in work on a dude who killed his pops. Soldier Slim would even put it in a verse. When I tell you uptown it goes down Eric Maurice they gave the nigga trust like a clown 
Which what is always left out of the story is that Eric Maurice cleared the courtyard of all the little dudes playing football because he was about to air it out. Soldier Slim just so happened to be one of those little dudes playing football in the court at the time. In another ep, Terrence Williams, aka Gangsta, would take to his YouTube channel to run an ep about his first hit. As a preteen, Terrence, who was intrigued by the older gangsters in the project, would find himself in their circle. Already having a reputation for being an up-and-coming young gangster, Killer Stone would give Terrence the nickname Lil Gangsta. Known for having all kind of artillery, one day while showing Terrence his burners, would challenge Terrence to back up the gangster talk that he was talking. The young Terrence wasn't talking to be talking, he was actually about that life. It wouldn't be long before Terrence would put in work on his target, which would ultimately end up being his first hit. Just like Nanny Go West, Eric Maurice had went with a move on Terrence, and old head had put it back on the intended target's head. Terrence had put in the work, but it was Eric Maurice who would get the bag. At a young age, Eric had put in more work than some of the older gangsters of his era. No stranger to beef, Eric Maurice would be shot himself when the Cadillo slid through the Noia busing. It was get it how you live in the streets of New Orleans. Dudes were pulling off all kinds of acts in the streets. Using guerrilla pimp tactics, Eric Maurice, who had a corrupt cop in his pocket, would use the cop to go with the move on D-Boys in the city. It was this tactic that would allegedly lead to the untimely demise of Eric Maurice. In an unfortunate turn of events, Eric Maurice would lose his life on July 1st of 1993. WWL-TV, Channel 4, New Orleans. John Snell, Angela Hill, Jim Henderson, and meteorologist Dave Barnes. This is Louisiana's news leader, Channel 4's Eyewitness News. A standoff between New Orleans police and an alleged murder suspect ends peacefully. An investigation on a New Orleans police officer is underway after a fatal shooting of a 16-year-old. And white supremacists look for more followers in Ascension Parish. Good evening. A standoff between police and a murder suspect on Mandeville Street ended just a few minutes ago. A SWAT team was able to get the man without firing any shots. Leo Alexander is at the scene and has an update. Leo? Angela, this standoff has been going on for just, it started just before 2 o'clock this afternoon. It ended successfully minutes ago. The SWAT team moved in. They located him inside, asked him to come outside without his weapon. He stepped outside, just put his foot outside the building, and that's when they grabbed him. No shots were fired. There were no no hostages inside, so all that was just a big bluff. Now, I'm joined with the lead negotiator and getting him out. Her name is Mrs. Roddy. Please, step up here. What was your state of mind like when you were talking to him? Just ask him as a friend, and he helped me to get out, you know? Yeah. I understand you... I was, asking him, I was telling him the pain is still there, but I want to help you. I keep telling him I want to help you. Just come out and release. Mm -hmm. Did he tell you anything? toward the end of it before he was telling me no i want to kill myself i told him it's not going to help if you kill yourself it's not worth it so come out and be a man and we're going to help you thank you very much how long did it take for him to get the message to come out and give himself up about one hour and a half good good, good work thank you mrs roddy John Angela, the standoff is over. There were no hostages. It all started on Monday night when the, the suspect, Mr. Abdul Jihan, killed his ex-wife, Lakita Parker, on Monday night. 33-year-old Lakita Parker was fatally wounded at the same location. He also shot a friend of his and wounded him, critically wounded him. His name is Mame Bakahan. And he's wounded and he's over at Charity Hospital right now in critical condition. I have Sergeant Marlon DeFillo standing right next to me. Marlon, how did it go? 
Well, after nearly four hours of constant communications with the gentleman, we were able to get him out of the house. And that was the, the focus, is to get him out of the house, away from the weapon. And they did just that. Uh, at that point, the members of the SWAT team moved in, were able to, and were able to physically subdue him. Okay. It was a big success then. There were no hostages. That's correct. Apparently, the information that he had given us uh, that there were hostages, uh, apparently there were none uh, after we searched the home. So now he will be charged with what? He's going to be charged with the first-degree murder of his wife and also attempted murder of the other man who was listed in uh, critical condition at Charity Hospital. Thank you very much, Sergeant DeFellow. That ends the hostage, bluff hostage situation here on Mandeville. Back to you, Angela.